Hi, everybody. AJ Heitman, and this is the uh, EMS Today Show. My spin on the uh, NBC EMS Today Show, but I certainly don't want to be sued. And uh, with me today is uh, my very special guest, and that's uh, Mike Tegman. Uh, many of you know him from his uh, national and international speakings, from his, uh, his, his overall background in EMS and his depth of experience. Uh, I know him as a guy that Jim Page used to say, hey, Mike, get a haircut. That's the guy that I know. <laughs> I, so I, Mike, I, 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 just, I just let it fall out rather than getting it cut. So it, was, yeah, it seems to be I taken know. care of it. But uh, I've known Mike a long time. He's a leading expert in improvement science, resilience, and stress management at First Watch, based out of Carlsbad, not far from me. Um, his broad experience helps him uh, turn data into real actionable information and uh, help teams build a resilience um, using the uh, neuroscience-based resilience first system, which he's gonna talk to us about. And I uh, teach stress management techniques that can be used by anyone, anywhere. And yeah. uh, I mean, I've, I've known Mike for a long time when we used to do uh, defensive tactics and other uh, seminars and Mike would uh, you know, be a master at that. And now he's a master at uh, managing stress. He's the, he's the author, co-author I should say, of the uh, Supercharge Your Stress Management in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, we'll give you a website, which is combatcovidstress.com. I'll repeat that later. And uh, facilitated development of the EMS Agenda 2050, uh, a vision for EMS in America 30 years in the future. Um, he's been inspired by the people-centered aspect of uh, Agenda 2050. And he worked with some of the world's leading physicians and researchers to bring evidence-based leadership, education, and practices and EMS. Um, all of this stuff helps organizations whose employees are resilient, joyful, thriving, and providing compassionate care. And uh, that's the reason that uh, we really wanted to get together, Mike and I. Um, he's, he's lectured in 48 of the 50 states, most of the Canadian provinces, Israel, Palestine, Australia, and throughout Europe. And uh, his, his expertise in EMS street survival, patient-centered leadership, effective quality, uh, improvement performance and resilience is, uh, is just epic. So um, he holds a master's degree in organizational systems and uh, is fre frequently a part of the faculty for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and certainly at EMS today. So uh, Mike, uh, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. It's good to be with you, AJ. And that was way too long an introduction. Yeah, I know, but you know what? The people that are on here, and we find this more and more, um, a lot of the people that I deal with today, when I mention Jim Page, they don't know Jim Page. Um, right. We just lost Jack Stout, who was, to me, uh, one of the most epic people that I ever met in my life. Uh, I went down to Florida to his fourth party seminar when I didn't even know what I was doing with it. I was an EMS director who thought, well, maybe I can implement this stuff in with volunteer services. And boy, was I fooled. Back, and, back at Centronia, right? Back, well, no, it was actually, I was in, uh, I was at Bethlehem Township, but I was the regional EMS yeah. director in 75 to 90. And uh, that's right. And I thought, well, maybe on certain days we could have one crew handle transports and another crew not because everybody was having trouble and i came back with all these wonderful concepts and yes. unit hour utilization and everybody was like we're not riding around in trucks we're not sitting in our trucks all day <laughs> well you know a, a lot of it and, and even back in the day when i first started with gems that's really when jack started to really do a lot of his writing um he didn't always agree with jim page and jim didn't agree with him and jim was one who felt that you know, you want a cruise to have some station time, et cetera. And Jack was the economist. Anyway, I'm digressing and we're talking about Jack. Yeah. Now, but there's so many good people like Tom Dick that, that people don't know. And you're one of those people that I, I lump in there because, you know, you've dedicated your life to this whole stuff. And uh, what, I, what I didn't mention in there is you started out on the streets as a street medic in Denver. Yeah. And uh, we were both chatting a little before we came on the air about our knee surgeries, mine that I just completed, and you having some coming up. And uh, we remarked about the fact, and I would say it to the audience here, um, don't do all your work down on your knees. Don't, don't do all your intubations kneeling. Don't run your codes all on your knees because I'm sure that There's an expiration date on them. 50%, there's no guarantee on that. And uh, 
you know, the patient does better and you, you end up that you can't even get up after a while. So anyway, um, how you been? I've been really good. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, the, the COVID stuff is, is kind of crazy and, uh, and losing Jack was, uh, was really sad and, and really stressful because he's been such a, a huge part of my, uh, my career in life and, uh, and, and really misunderstood by a lot of the folks on the front line and a lot of people who don't know him, they hear the name and they think, oh, here's the guy who made us sit on street corners and ambulances. And, uh, and that is like, you know, one one hundredth of one percent of the kind of systems thinking that Jack brought to the world. And, and between him and Jim Page, you know, they really, they really kind of constructed the mental model and the experience that we all have of EMS today. Um, I mean, you can't go to an EMS system, at least I haven't been to one anywhere on the planet, that doesn't have some aspect or some component of something that Jack invented. Well, and, I'll tell you, when I, you know, when, I, when I first came out and when Keith Griffiths and uh, Jim convinced me to come out and run the consulting division, I won't name the name of the system, but we were, went into a system that was uh, the fire department wanted to take over from a really good um, system status management type system. And yep. they wanted to take over the ALS. And uh, it came down to the fact that, and all Jim Page said to me is, I don't care which way you decide, but if you decide against the fire department who contracted us, then I want to be the one to tell the fire chief. And I came back one morning and Jim said, what's your decision? And I said, uh, you know, we went and we met with the union the other day and we said, you know, guys, at three in the morning, when uh, engine 27 and medic 42 are on a call, you might have to bring engine 46 over to engine 42 station. And the guys were like, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I worked in this department for 20 years. I bid on this outstation, that's my home. I don't leave my station. We are not gonna do this rotational stuff. And there's no way that they were gonna backfill. And uh, if anything that Jack taught us, it's not so much about the, the uh, system status and unit hours, and that, that's very important. But what's important is that you have an ambulance in place at the right position at the right time so grandma doesn't choke on her graham cracker in the nursing home. You know, it, 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 we talk about being patient-centered as kind of revolutionary in our EMS Agenda 2050 design, but Jack's system design really put the patient at the center. You know, have the doctors be in charge of the medicine. Um, I have the system designed so that it provides the best possible care available for the resources that are available. And, and everything was really focused around that. And, and the, the convenience of everybody else is important and he always had a consideration for it, but he always put patients first. And that's, and that's hard to do as well, a leader because there's a lot of forces that kind of fight against that. I was sad the other day and my wife said, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, you know, I knew that Jack was going, uh, you know, I knew that he was failing from his dementia. And I said, I wish I could ask him one more question. And she said, what's that? And I said, I wish that I could ask him how he would build the component of something like a pandemic into the middle of a system status or a high performance system, because all of a sudden you're not running calls anymore. Right. And then the next day on your performance schedule, you're running five cardiac arrests in a row. And so I don't know that anybody has really been ready for this. We'll probably see a lot of systems that could tell us some pretty important information by the time we get around to EMS today. But, um, you know, I've, I've talked to people that said, AJ, I've never, I've never run so many codes in my life. And I've never gone into a home where I've seen so many people that I knew were going to be affected probably by COVID because they weren't going to the hospital. They all live together. Ethnic groups, uh, you know, the Hispanics and others that have 10, 15 lovely family members living with them um, are just going to blow this thing out of the water. So, um, and, and the other thing that uh, has been bothering me is, uh, you know, I'm a, a big zealot about the pay. The guys in New York uh, don't yep. make the right amount of pay. Uh, in San Diego County, for example, I could be a contact tracer for $22 an hour. That's more than some EMTs are making. And I could be on the phone asking people right. who they came in contact with. And, and yet the people that are out running calls aren't making as much money as, let's say, the contact tracer. 
and and that that builds on what we're talking about here today with stress. Uh, I saw online that uh, Austin, Texas is having problems because um, the crews are being hustled. Uh, there, there's so many calls now that are being picked up that they're being told, you know, don't sanitize as much as you normally sanitize. Just hurry, hurry, hurry and get back in service. So, you know, demand in the age of COVID um, is not really appropriate. I mean, we got to make sure these people don't get sick and die. Ab absolutely, absolutely a concern. But the principles of, you know, thinking about things from a system perspective. So, you know, the issue of, you know, you design a system around your task time and how long, how many calls you've got, where they happen and how long they take. Well, when you're using PPE and proper doffing of PPE, add to that task time significantly. So, you, you know, you have to have metrics that take a look at that. When you show up at hospitals, hospital turnaround times are affected and it depends on the, depends on the system. We, you know, we work with customers all over the country. Uh, some of them have seen almost a doubling of their task time with the donning and doffing right. um, requirements and expectations. Um, some have seen their hospital turnaround time shorten because the hospitals don't want extra vectors in their hospital. Others, right. it's really prolonged because they've got a really elaborate system for bringing people in and trying to do it in a way that is, is virus safe. And there's, you know, it's not, not the same everywhere, but, but it's all happening. And if you've got systems in place that monitor and pay attention to, to those issues as they're happening, you can adjust uh, things as, as they happen around that, which is really critical. Well, which is the point, and that is that some systems do it marginally and, and aren't really looking at that, or some managers are saying, I don't care, our turnaround time is not going to be less than 30 minutes. Well, you know, it takes me 15 minutes to doff my gear <coughs> and to stow yeah. it and to clean up and then to go out and clean up the ambulance and then to get ready to go on the next call. And, um, you know, I, I, I believe, well, we could talk about stress a lot, and, and we'll, I want to talk about your book, but... I really believe that we're in an era almost like um, people can understand why we had so much stress and suicide in Afghanistan. And one of the reasons that we do and did and do is that um, people are constantly looking over their shoulder. It wasn't like Vietnam where you could fly in and, and fly people out and put them in a safe zone. There is no safe zone. And I really believe that we're in a situation now where um, in EMS, there is no safe zone. Everybody is a suspect. Every patient is a suspect. Well, uh, and, and, and that's true for personal life when you're not at work as well, right? I mean, right. You, know, you talk about no, no safe zone. It's like, you know, oh, I, you know, I, I made it through my whole shift and I wasn't exposed. But then somebody, I was in the grocery store the other day and, and there was a woman with a surgical mask on over in the produce section. She does the... <gasps> Like she's going to sneeze and she pulls her mask down to sneeze into the open air right over the uh, organic honey crisp apples and then put her mask back up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the EMS Today show. Um, I'm hoping that my uh, internet connection will hold. It hasn't been holding all day. So uh, we're going to be talking with Mike Tagan about strep and he's going to try and bring me down off of the wall if, uh, if the internet connection fails. Uh, Mike, uh, internationally famous for his work in the area of stress, is uh, the recent author of a textbook on stress in the, uh, in the era of, uh, of COVID. And, and I think that's really important that we, uh, that we talk about it. Um, the title of the book is Supercharge Your Stress Management in the Age of COVID-19. And uh, it's available on Amazon and other places, uh, combatcovidstress.com. And... Uh, Mike has uh, facilitated so many things like the 2015 uh, vision for EMS in America and uh, is one of the stellar employees with uh, First Watch, particularly in the area of stress. So um, what, are, what are your responsibilities with First Watch with respect, respect to stress? Because uh, First Watch has really come out of, to be one of the leaders with the new database. You know, we, uh, we, we got... Uh, concerned early on we had uh, a, a lot of clients what we do at, at first watch is we, um, we we plug into people's data streams and data systems and and monitor for all different kinds of things help them with clinical quality and 
response time performance and financial performance and all all kinds of things. And a lot of uh, customers were uh, coming to us asking us to build uh, triggers where we would look at their CAD data and their electronic medical record data and identify calls or patterns of calls that might be emotionally or psychologically stressful. So we could automatically alert their peer support team or their CISM team or their uh, EAP or their chaplain or whatever resources the organization had <coughs> to go in and provide some psychological first aid um, to folks who just, you know, handled a decapitation or uh, somebody was alive when they showed up trapped in a burning building and didn't survive or whatever the, the kinds of calls we all know about that can be emotionally and psychologically traumatic for folks. Um, and we just, we got, got to thinking of, you know, is there something more we can do for folks? And uh, started started doing research, and uh, um, I when I when I work the streets, and it's been a while since I worked the streets. But one of the things I noticed is that you'd have a, a big incident, you know, an officer involved shooting or a uh, plane crash or something like that, and some people would show up and be just cool, calm, and collected, and others were were kind of frantic. And you know, we'd have these big events and had people come in and and do the critical and sense stress management and psychologists and facilitate those conversations and <clears throat> I noticed some people were like sad but able to go back to work some people had to take a week or two off and right. some people were like never able to come back to work and so trying to figure out what, what's the difference between people who do okay and people who don't do okay and is there something else we can provide um, started doing research to see is there is there an organization we might partner with that can offer, and, and resilience is the place we started, um, which is really building you know, psychological, emotional, physical um, strength so that you can handle tougher situations without getting messed up in the process. Um, so we did a lot of research, uh, found a lot of different places, and ended up partnering uh, with a, a group of neuroscientists and data geeks in Sydney, Australia, um, who've got a, a research validated uh, 16 question assessment tool um, called the PR6 um, that you can take in about three minutes and it gives you a good look at your nutritional, your physical, your sleep, um, your response to emotions, this really comprehensive look at your um, resilience. And then they've got this really cool artificially intelligent <coughs> machine learning driven basically teaching interface um, that basically turns your phone into a, a resilience coach. Um, and we partnered with them to build um, what's called our resilience first product, um, which is, this is, I know we didn't sign up to do this as an advertisement, so that's not what I intend to do. Sure, but sure. Um, and answer, in answer to your question, I kind of lead that team. Um, also very plugged in with the clinical team and very plugged in with um, improvement science and helping, you know, one of our objectives is to help, help our customers make things better in their system and organization. So those are the, those are the kinds of things I'm plugged into. Well, my history with First Watch, obviously, I know all of your products and they all work and your people are geniuses. So how has this product, which I'm sure works, how has it uh, already proven itself? You know, it, um, one of the, one of the, <coughs> our first uh, customers um, was a, uh, uh, fire department uh, that provides uh, EMS transport and uh, fire suppression services. And they started uh, using it uh, comprehensively and had been using it for a, a few months when they had a, a house fire that had an ex explosion while they were managing the fire uh, through a couple of their firefighters uh, completely across the street from the force of the explosion. Um, they initially thought two of their firefighters were dead in the process that turned out they weren't and they were seriously injured but have now recovered um, but the the chief's assessment was you know having done this resilience work with all of our team members before this incident just set us up to get through this without having you know, anybody really get PTSD or any of the any of the more serious psychological issues that can happen um, as a result of this so that it it, it really it, it sets people up to get through stressful situations, manage day-to-day -day stress, and it, 
it really seems to help people improve performance. Well, how does it do that? How does it does it give you um, tips that AJ needs uh, somebody to talk to him right now? You know, it's it's not designed to be a diagnostic tool that says you're you're in trouble. That's not not what it's designed to do. It's really an educational system. So I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. One of the you know one of the many uh, uh, strategies for being able to manage your emotions in the moment is labeling your emotion and being able to label it. So my wife, uh, Sasha, who you know, um, uh, you know, most things in EMS, we say don't try this at home, but this is, this is one we encourage people to try at home. My wife had been working the system for a while and our, uh, our son, who was eight at the time, uh, was eating uh, a bowl of rigatoni with marinara sauce in front of the television, which I know is bad parenting, but we do it a fair amount anyhow. And he, he still had about half his bowl left and he was uh, bringing it back into the kitchen and he tripped on one of his mini Legos. Um, he is a Lego fanatic. He's building an entire Harry Potter or Hogwarts thing <laughs> in the living room as I'm talking to you in this moment. Um, but he tripped on one of his mini Legos and Sasha was standing right there as he tripped. And, and Sasha likes white furniture. So we have white club chairs, we have two white sofas, we have a uh, white uh, table, we have white paint on the walls. And she's seeing this Jackson Pollock Rorschach of marinara sauce being sprayed on all of her white stuff. And I saw that initial look that you know, we've all seen on the looks of our moms at one point in time during our childhoods. And, but she, she took a quick breath and she muttered to herself, she didn't really say it you know, like to either of us, but she said it to herself, she said, what am I really feeling right now? Which is one of the tools she learned mm -hmm. um, in developing resilience. And, uh, and she said, what I'm feeling is surprised. She said, I'm feeling surprised. She said, Axe, who's our son. She said, Axe, are, are you feeling, I'm feeling surprised. Are you feeling surprised? And he's like, I'm, I'm really surprised that surprise is the word that's coming out of your mouth right now, mom. And <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad that's the word. And, and so they just got together and just cleaned up the mess with no drama. Whereas, you know, six months ago before the training, um, it would have been a really upset mom and a really up, sad little kid in the process. So, you know, it's all, it's all kind of about. And, you know, it could have been blood versus marinara sauce. So in all things. Contained, right, right. You know, right. Temper it. Exactly. 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 So, so talk to me. I mean, you, you get around a lot and you know that um, this is probably one of the most stressful five years that we've seen in EMS and we've seen more suicides than we've ever seen before. Um, what kind of trends and patterns are you seeing? You know, um, there's a, <clears throat> there are, you know, I, and there's a lot of different ways you kind of stay plugged in. So um, if you're a social media person, uh, I, I've got a whole lot of EMS and, and fire and law enforcement friends on, on Facebook and on, on LinkedIn and, and we follow each other on Twitter and whatnot. And, and one of the things I noticed, you know, in April is a whole bunch of folks saying, you know, I can take early retirement. I think now's the time to take my retirement. You know, it's like I was going to work another four or five years, but I don't, I don't need to expose myself to this virus that's going to uh, potentially wipe me out. I don't, I don't, don't need to do that. Um, you know, and the, and you know, not, not too far after the kind of the launching of, of COVID, um, you know, we, we ended up with the, the racial problems and racial unrest. Not that we, we haven't, we've had racial problems in the United States since before the United States was created. I mean, I don't want to, uh, you know, minimize that in any way, shape, or form. But the, but the most most recent kind of heightened uh, heightened attention and uh, and and issues around that, and you know, it's just it it's it's a scary scary time to do this stuff. Um, so I've I've talked to people who used to have you know 500 applications and you know for two positions on their department, and and especially in the law enforcement world, there's like you know we, we can't get anybody to apply. It's like it doesn't, it doesn't look like a very fun way to make a living uh, for folks right now. So it's a, it's a challenge around all that stuff. Um, well, there, there were always stressors when I was running the streets and when you were on the streets of Denver, there was always stressors, but there was never uh, somebody who was live streaming me over Facebook 
running a code or never right. somebody who was hearing a police officer say, hey, is there something you can give this dude to calm him down? And now it's all captured on video. The whole Everything. fentanyl thing that's happening in, the, in Colorado and things is under the microscope. And, yep. uh, and then the other thing is that um, we've always had the relationship with police that they call us when they need us and they give us the patient when they're ready with the patient. And now that time is changing because as we saw with the Floyd case, um, he needed CPR and he needed it as soon as that crew arrived on the scene. And so it's like a Sully Sullenberg thing where we have to be able to touch the patient and say, my patient and take it away from the police. So, and, and on top of all that, now what's happened is that nobody trusts anybody. The public doesn't want the police. Pretty soon they're not gonna trust EMS because we're friends with the police. And uh, it, it's a very tough time. I wouldn't want to be an EMT or a medic right now in Chicago. I mean, those poor guys have my dearest respect because nobody Absolutely. respects anybody. Nobody respects anybody. And my friends in, in FDNY, you know I've been on a tirade for years about the, the pay scale at FDNY for, uh, you know, for a medic and an EMT versus a firefighter. And, and they're running on every single COVID call. And uh, it, it's just not fair. So... Those people are getting up in the morning and they're putting their socks on and they're thinking, I got to go to work again for this amount of pay uh, and work this number of calls in this type of environment and then come home and take two showers before I see my son go to bed. Um, so it, it's a tough time. And, and so what kind of skills can we give people to, to get over it? Your, your book goes through the whole process. So take me through some of the process. You know, I, I, I think that the, uh, the to think about it is that you're traveling down the road of life. Uh, resilience is the stuff that you do before you get into the muck. Stress management skills are the things that take care of you while you're in the muck. And then if you get a psychological or emotional injury on the other side, you've got trauma-informed therapy, EMDR, prolonged exposure therapy, um, a, a number of modalities to help you if you're injured on the other side. And, and, and it's, and they're Venn diagrams, right? They all kind of overlap each other. Um, but you know, when I when I you know really started getting into this, one of the one of the places I really borrowed a lot of concepts and ideas from is the United States Army. Um, they have this uh, concept called Battle Mind, um, which is um, a whole group of military psychologists uh, working together to help prepare soldiers to go into battle, to give them tools. To to manage the fear and the emotions of being in combat, and then some processes to help them decompress. So before they go back home and recontact their families, so that they can, uh, you know, be be grounded and and not do a lot of the things that end up in divorce and, and problems and those kinds of things associated with that prolonged stress. Um, so um, the the resilience stuff is really important, and that and that's you know that eating well and sleeping well and um, getting your exercise and um, having uh, time where you're, whether it's in meditation or prayer or deep relaxation or, you know, listening to relaxing music or whatever your thing happens to be where you just kind of can mentally um, relax for a little bit. Having those practices in your life are, are important to help build your capacity to deal with stress. But when you're, when you're in the, in the middle of a, a, a situation and, and uh, a, a patient who's got a, a fever and who's lost their uh, sense of, of taste tells you, you know, I, I, I've got asthma. I'm exempt from wearing a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask while you care for me. You know, it's like, you know, and you're being filmed uh, while somebody's, you know, what, you know whatever, whatever that process is. That resilience, if you haven't done it ahead of time, it's not going to be very helpful for you in the middle of the mess. So our, our book um, is all very focused on uh, taking care of you in the moment when you're having issues. So one of the things you can do with me right now, AJ, and, and whoever's listening can do this too, is just wiggle your toes. Are you wiggling your toes? Yes, I am. Wiggle your toes, right? And people look at me like I got three heads and it's like, are you kidding me? Are we in kindergarten now? You're telling me to wiggle my toes? Yeah. Well, if, you know, if you understand the neuroscience of the stress response, remember that stress response is designed to, to keep 
us from being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or to you know, have us find a new mate or, or find dinner. I mean, it's basically got three things it does in our world, right? Um, and part of the, you know, the, the fight, flight, freeze, or faint sympathetic nervous system stress response is you lose sensation in your extremities. And that's so that if you get bit by the tiger or the wolf or the bear or uh, the dog or whatever it is that's, that's attacking you, that the pain won't be as intense. So you'll still be able to, to fight uh, and hopefully get away, right? Also closes down your peripheral blood vessels so that if you get bit, you don't bleed as fast, so you're, you're more likely to survive. So it's all part of the, that survival mechanism. Well, you know, when you're dealing with a, a patient who's got signs and symptoms of COVID or uh, you're on the, on the front lines embedded with a, a law enforcement team that's doing uh, demonstration duty and control or you know, whatever it is that you're involved in that is stressful in the moment, um, you're not going to run away or beat up most of the patients you're dealing with. That's not, those are not kind of reasonable things. Um, so what you want to do is fool your nervous system into activating the relaxation response. It's about tricking your nervous system. And, and when you wiggle your toes, you're bringing attention to the furthest part of your extremity, bringing that attention back and kind of reversing the stress response. And I, when I, uh, I taught this on a webinar, I don't know, a, a month and a half or so ago, and uh, I got a, an email from one of the respondents, uh, one of the participants in the webinar, who, who's an F-16 fighter pilot. And uh, he, uh, in his email, he described that uh, when he was ready to fly his first mission over Iraq, um, he was in his aircraft and his squadron commander was you know up on the ladder next to the uh, uh, cockpit and giving him his last minute uh, flight instructions before closing the hatch. And his, uh, his squadron commander said, I just, throughout this flight, I just want you to remember one thing. And he was thinking, okay, I gotta pay attention to my aileron or I gotta uh, look at my wing gap with other aircraft or you know keep my eye on the horizon. And, and his instructor, Director said, I want you to wiggle your toes throughout the flight. And he's like, wiggle my toes? Really? And his squadron commander says, if you'll wiggle your toes throughout the flight, more of your head will be in the game. Your performance will improve and you'll feel better throughout the flight. And then I was, I was teaching stress management to the, uh, the reproductive medicine faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. So University of Pennsylvania is one of the world-class reproductive medicine uh, groups um, anywhere in the world. So I've got all these physicians who are obstetricians and gynecologists, and I'm telling them this story about the F-16 fighter pilot. And they said, you know, whenever we're going to do a painful procedure on a patient, we tell the patient to wiggle their toes through the process. So there's a, a neuroscience-based strategy that if you practice it and, and use it regularly, it's available to you and you can do it in any circumstance, in any situation. Well, I, um, I said to my wife the other day, I said, you know, I, I guess I'm glad I'm not on the street right now. And she said, why? And I said, well, number one, because I have comorbid factors. I'm, I'm older and the disease is looking for guys like me. I'm a prime candidate for it. Um, but on top of that, really on top of that, I said, the, uh, it, it's like going for gasoline when you get premium and then premium plus. I used to go, like when I'd work part-time in Allentown, I, I'd want the challenges of every shift because every call was a different challenge, an OB, a shooting, a stabbing, a psychological or whatever. But now it's, it's calls plus. Uh, COVID is on top of everything that we're doing. So it's like the soldier in Afghanistan who doesn't know whether the, the Afghani next to him is, is friendly or not friendly and always has to sleep with one eye open. Uh, EMS today is 24/7 COVID. I, I, I'm not in. I'm not on the street, and I'm tired of COVID. Right, right, and many people are. And you, I mean, you know, EMS providers, they deal with all the other issues we deal with in society, right? You know, so it's like, you know, if you've got kids, you know, are your kids going back to school? Are they going to be on Zoom school? Are they going to be some hybrid, um, you know, the school says they're going to, you know, keep, you know, my third grader six feet apart from his 
fellow students and you know what's the likelihood of them being successful at, at doing that and you can you know instantly imagine kids you know running around you know saying i got covid and touching each other to play a game and um and and we've all got all got all the issues that everybody else in society has plus the work that we do so we need to we need to be extra careful and you know the other thing to, to keep in mind and i and i think this has um been a factor in some of the the law enforcement demonstrator conflicts that have happened recently is that everybody who's going to those protests on on, on whatever side or facts or perspective you've got you're already at an elevated stress level mm-hmm. and you know how uh you know how if you take a bite of uh, pizza that's too hot and you burn your mouth the second bite of pizza hurts worse because you've already kind of activated your whole nervous system right, right. or you stub right. your toe toe go into the bathroom they stub the toe the second time it hurts way worse so the trigger level for people to respond with anger or violence or whatever um it's, it's just higher i was i was in the grocery store a couple of weeks ago and i always thank the people who are there for coming to work you know because it's like if you don't come to work i don't get to eat and, right and, right uh, you're, you're putting yourself at risk to take care of me which matters and i always say how are you doing i said are people being nice to you today and uh, um, and the guy, the guy says, no. And I, usually they're saying, oh, yeah, everybody's nice. But he said, yeah, no. Yeah. And I was like, what what happened? And he said, well, you know, there was a, a lady, you know, with, I don't know how old she was, but she had gray hair. And when I asked her to, to keep six feet back from the person that was checking out, she, she got mad and she started picking up stuff out of her grocery cart and throwing it at my head from from the cart. And you know, like trying to bean me with cans of beans and and whatnot, because I asked her to, you know, keep a six foot distance from the person in front of it. And it's like, I I have no idea who this lady was. They chose not to involve law enforcement, which kind of surprised me a little bit. But I have a theory that, you know, her stress level was already elevated from all this stuff that's going on in our world. And so one little request, maybe flipped her over into an emotional hijack. That she wouldn't have had otherwise and and we're all at risk for this and every call our crews go on people who are already upset by somebody having chest pain or having been stabbed or whatever have an extra layer of anxiety that they're dealing with the crews already have an extra layer of anxiety their colleagues from other agencies have an extra level of anxiety so the so the potential for violence or hurt feelings or people saying or do, doing something that they later would regret would never do otherwise it's it's just a higher possibility in our world and and as i'm as i'm saying this i'm aware that you know our stress response it's really controllable if you have the tools to work it effectively you can dial down your stress response really quickly you can go from a a jacked feeling to much calmer in 90 seconds just by taking care of yourself a little bit well how do you dial down uh to me social media adds a lot of stress uh i'm i'm not unlike anybody else i'm addicted to my uh cell phone and and text messages and everything else and uh you can't get away from the word covid um and if you do something wrong today in ems and i've had friends people that work for me who've committed suicide, who I saw on Facebook in a tirade and thought, geez, you know, I, I, he didn't work for me. It was 20 years ago. I'm not really his boss now. Somebody should talk to him. And I didn't pick up the phone and call him. And he ended up taking his own life because he uh, had a midlife crisis and he was reprimanded at work and he took to Facebook. And when he took to Facebook, other people were damning him on Facebook. So they, they kept throwing fuel on the fire. There's a lot of fuel being thrown on the fire and, and you just can't get away from it. You can't do anything right or wrong without somebody commenting on your performance. So, you know, how do you, uh, my wife and I set up an area at our house that's called the no phone zone. And every night we go out there and we, I just posted today, we watch no hummingbirds come into a hummingbird roost. And it's the most relaxing 30 minutes that we spend in a day. And we just don't bring our phones out. 
you know, that's just the way it is. And, uh, but I worry about social media an awful lot because uh, it really you, does. You know, I, people. people are cruel on Facebook, at, well, on social media. They, they, they absolutely are and can be. And one of the, one of the things that's um, interesting to me is because a lot of people, they get a lot of love and support on social media as well. Um, and, and so one of the, one of the things that is interesting to me, I, had, I uh, earlier this morning had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's a really an expert trauma psychologist, um, Cody Todd, who comes from a, a firefighter family and works a lot with, uh, frontline, frontline providers around trauma and is just really a, uh, emotional and psychological trauma expert. And we were, uh, really talking about, um, uh, shame and its contribution to uh, suicide and PTSD and depression and that, that how big a factor that is. Um, and one of the things, you know, I, 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 I think about on Facebook, it, it's like I, you know, the, the thing that pushes my buttons, and I, you know, I've got friends of all different, every political extreme you could imagine. And it's like, <laughs> that stuff doesn't bother me. It's just entertaining to me. Right, right. And, and I have got I've got friends who are organizing Black Lives Matter protests, and I've got friends who are in law enforcement suiting up in riot gear to go manage those same protests. And every extreme you could possibly imagine, I got a lot of friends. Um, but the anti-mask people, for some reason, just pissed me off. And and I found, you know, I I I, I have this policy of trying not to argue with people on Facebook. But this one kind of grabbed me a couple of times, right? And so I, I would find myself going snarky and, and and noticing my own stress level go up in my typing my responses to whatever it is that they had said that was anti-mask. And you know, just kind of being aware of one, I'm stressed. Two, nobody is going to wear a mask that doesn't want to wear a mask because I told them to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm unlikely to to to, to add any real safety to them individually. I have this theory that maybe some of their followers will pay attention to something I say. And then the, the third part of it was, is that I was posting memes and saying things that were kind of shaming to them for not following the guidelines, right? And in realizing, you know, the correlation between shame and suffering and and it's it's, contribution to suicidal thoughts and and suicidal actions i've really kind of stepped back and, and taken a few actions for myself one uh if you're an, an anti-masker even if you're you know one of my best friends or a family member i'm i'm unfriending you because i just don't want to see that in my feed because i it, it it's just stressful to it me. doesn't help it. me at all um uh, so i i mean i i do that part and then i'm I'm careful, I, you know, I do provide some educational things and I try to share some science um, and, and those kinds of things, but I, I uh, am, have been much more conscientious about trying not to shame people with my feedback, um, which is an important distinction because it's easy to go there. Um, and the other thing is um, for folks that need help, you know, I got a, a, a buddy of mine who I work with um, who uh, he both he and his uh, fiance got COVID together, and and he uh, I sent him a pulse oximeter and his you know pulse ox. He's texting me things about you know I was at I was ninety six today. I'm ninety seven. He's not a not a medical person. He's got a law enforcement background. He was texting me these things, and then he was like, "My fever is one hundred and seven, and my O two sat is seventy two. And he's like heading to the hospital and you know ended up they tried all kinds of stuff on him he ended up uh, intubated on a ventilator actually did really well um but you know as soon as as soon as all that happened his fiance and him decided to make it public on facebook what, what they were going through and you know asking for prayers and healing vibes so i i shared their story on my facebook page and i got you know 600 responses in an hour and a half of people, you know, praying, sending healing vibes, you know, offering to, you know, bring drinks to their house, you know, whatever, whatever they needed. Um, and then as he's made his recovery, 
all those people who contributed and helped from that perspective have been able to share. And you know, the day before yesterday, he got extubated and is off the ventilator and is awake and functioning and is on a path to make a full recovery. And and you know, there's something kind of magical about being able to recruit all these people. Um, I had, I mean, I had, I had um, on 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 this thread. I had friends in Israel. I had friends in Palestine. I had friends in Australia. I I had a friend in Libya who was Times Man of the Year for his care of Ebola patients yeah. on Facebook, praying for my buddy Dave. Right, and and without that connection, wouldn't have been able to pull that off. Right. Yeah. And. I I've had a lot of people tell me that um, if you go into this with the idea that you have, you're going to have the will to survive, then you can survive. And if, and if you've got all those good thoughts going, I really believe that there's kind of a magical thing that's happening for it. But there's another thing that we need to talk about, and that's complacency. Um, you know, with this whole COVID thing, um, everybody's out there, well, six feet, 12 feet, blah, 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 blah. I posted something from a friend who said that the only thing that they could come down with about how he got it is that he touched a gas nozzle. And I posted that and said, wow, a friend of mine just told me he works for a hospital. And uh, some mutual people that we know wrote back and fried me. That's not scientific based. And what are you talking about? And you're spreading. Well, you know what? Christy Whitman and the whole gang after 9-11, they lied to everybody. I mean, there is no question that everything inside those towers was carcinogen and fuser oil and asbestos. And after day two or three, when they said the air quality was okay, you could take your masks off, uh, complacency set in and people began to take their masks That's off. Safe. And my big concern now is I'm hearing from a lot of people that they go back to station and they're still eating around the same table. They're not wearing masks in the station. Um, they think that, nah, well, if I didn't get it now, I'm never going to get it. And uh, we just lost a Houston firefighter the other day, 29 years on the job. And, and somebody gave it to him. And, and, he, and if you're in EMS or fire, you go to work, you go home, you go to work, you go home. And, and with COVID, you're probably not going on a vacation on the weekend. So where, in fact, did that person get it? So uh, I, I really worry about complacency. You know no, I I do too, and you know the I mean the the story is that we're tired of the virus, but the virus isn't tired of us. Mm -mm. Um, and you know one of the you know and you know, stress we start talking about stress. Stress is one of those. It's a mixed bag, right? Because a little stress will help keep you on your game. A little stress will make sure that that N95 is sealed before yeah. you go in. A, a little stress will make sure that you know. You know, you got an itch on your nose, and it's like, I haven't washed my hands. I, had, I a little stress will remind you that I'm not, I'm not going to scratch my nose until I wash my hands. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you I, so we we need a little bit to maintain our vigilance. And and you right? and I we need a little bit to maintain our vigilance. You and I grew up in an environment where we didn't have a safety officer on the scene of a fire scene. And, and how many stupid things happen there. And, and I tell everybody now, just like the background photo that I have here, people have masks on. You see a white helmet with a mask on. Um, you don't know if the guy is it your friend who has, uh, you know, all of the symptoms and is having his wife race him to the hospital and gets into a wreck. You don't know that the motor vehicle accident that you're going to isn't a COVID positive patient. And, and I always joke about it. I really wish that COVID or any of these other things like sepsis, uh, had a green film to it that you saw it outside your door, you saw it coming down the street, then that would be real to you. But um, this isn't real. But I, I can tell you in talking to people that have run codes with it, and I think we've talked about it, um, when that kind of storm happens and everything inside your lungs begins to go crazy, um, I've had people tell me they pulled the endotracheal tube out that looked like maple syrup on it. And that's awful hard to ventilate around maple syrup. So um, not to be too much of an alarmist, but uh, I wrote on, on our gems.com yesterday, you know, we've made it five months. We could make it six or seven more months. That's my hope.
you know, the only way we're going to be safe is when we have a vaccine. Well, actually, actually, I think treatment is the key. I think we're going to get a good treatment yeah. treatment before we get a vaccine. But I'm, you know, I mean, everybody who's predicting everything, you know, there are people much smarter than I am making uh, making predictions. Um, it's just that vaccine development takes a lot longer, and you don't know about how long the immunity you get from it lasts, and um, you know whether you can get it again. I mean, there's a whole lot of I mean, the amount we don't know is so much bigger than the amount we know about this virus. Yeah. Um, but if we could come up with an effective treatment, it's like, you know, you think about, think about AIDS and remember the AIDS crisis. You and I both grew up, you know, during the, the time of that in, entire process. And it's like, never really came up with a vaccine to protect you against it, but came up with effective treatments and the boatloads of people who are dying aren't, aren't dying anymore from it. I mean, uh, you know, that was that was really the, the key turnaround and 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 you still need to practice safe sex and not share needles and you know aids has not gone away um but the you know the the practices to prevent transmission are, are more hardwired into the culture hopefully uh, um and you know i i did that a little bit um the practices to prevent transmission they're gonna they're gonna need to be with us for a long time and and, and you and i have uh I spent a whole lot of our lives at conferences and, and some concerts together, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a while before those things are possible again. And, and we're not sure, you know, if they'll, they'll ever be the kind of things that we experienced, you know, throughout our, our personal and professional lives coming up to this point. And, and for me, it's helpful to kind of wrap my head around. So, you know, if I don't, get to go to conferences anymore how does that how does that work in my world and i i can be sad about it and grieve for it or whatever for a little bit um but then it's like so what can i do you know so i can i can write a book i can get better at, at offering you know zoom based classes or webinar or whatever whatever those kinds of things happen to be i can you know focus on providing a good education for my nine-year-old whatever those those things happen to be and really you know, we're, we've been so focused on kind of the fear and the things we can't do. And it's like, what can you do? You know, uh, and, you know, within your, within your, your cruise station, you can decide to wear masks and just, and, and do that and realize that even though it feels like a family in our, in our station, we're not really a family pod. We, we, every one of us has got a whole set of other vectors that we're bringing in with us every day. And, and we have the potential to share those. So organizing the station in our work so that we are less likely uh, to share virus amongst each other is just smart. And, and if you really care about your brothers and sisters in the, in the, in the service and organization, you'll, you'll do your part to help protect them and, and knowing that you never know when you're going to be a carrier because you can be sp have the disease and be spreading it for several days before you show symptoms, if you ever show symptoms at all. Yeah, if anything, it's, it's, it's predictably unpredictable. And, and variety is a spice of life. I have about six or seven different masks, and I, I like a little variety. If I'm going somewhere where I think sure. it's a really bad area, then I put my real good N95 on. If I'm sitting around with some friends outside a restaurant, then I wear something a little more comfortable because I get tired of it, man. I've had respiratory problems. I walk through the supermarket. By the time I get out of there, I'm spent. I can't imagine a crew carrying somebody down three flights of stairs with a mask on. Right. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about sleep deprivation because, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of work being done on sleep deprivation. And that's a, that's a particular area that I'm hearing is really important with COVID that if you take zinc or if you take you know, an extra couple of hours sleep that you, you tend to do better. And I don't think we're going to know all this stuff until maybe two years after we have a vaccine or treatment modality. But one thing is for sure is we've learned a long time ago that sleep deprivation is like being drunk. And uh, so we got to pay attention to that. Well, it, it, you know, the whole sleep hygiene and fatigue and, you know, our, uh, our friend Daniel Patterson um, has, uh, has, you know, basically dedicated his entire life to this stuff. And, and the consequences of not sleeping well, I mean, um, I, I suspect a significant portion of my, my obesity
obesity is, uh, has been contributed to by my uh, poor sleep practices over the years. I, uh, I was one of those guys who, you know, I, four or five hours of sleep a night's plenty for me. Um, when I'm at conferences, if I get three, it's great. Um, I, I, and, I, and I had a little swagger, right? That was kind of like bragging rights of, you know, how, how little sleep I got and how I'm functioning. And, I, you know, you'd get people to go, ooh, and, and think you're cool. And, and that was just uh, stupid. Um, it contributes, uh, you know, it, it, it contributes to all different kinds of inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, neurovascular diseases, uh, potentially contributes to some cancers. Um, and, and good sleep hygiene is a, is a vital part of stress management. And, you know, one of the things, you know, after spending a lot of time with Daniel, actually, I'm really working on improving my sleep hygiene. So I, I have the little uh, Apple Watch here, and I, uh, I you know, wear this to bed, um, so I get uh, feedback on my sleep every night, and it measures how much sleep I get, uh, what my heart rate is, and my heart rate dip through the evening, um, and how much deep sleep I'm getting where I'm not moving and my heart rate's low enough. And and once you kind of get the system, you can do little experiments on yourself. So it's like I, I like chocolate. You know, does chocolate affect my sleep? Um, I'm not a huge drinker, but one of the things I figured out is that one beer or one glass of wine and I get no deep sleep that night, not a minute. And that, and that, and that is reliable for me. And so now when I, you know, we go to a restaurant and uh, the wait person comes up and says, you know, what would you like to drink? The first thought that comes to my mind is, do I want to give up a, a night's sleep tonight? And I'm, I'm in an age where I, I don't have that many nights sleeps left necessarily so i yeah. i don't want to give up a night's sleep so i i mean i i'm down to drinking maybe once or twice a year um because i really want to improve my sleep and 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 with stress and all those kinds of things sometimes it can be harder for folks um so you know there's there's a number of good apps and those kinds of things that can help you fall asleep faster stay asleep um <coughs> you know decreasing your caffeine intake for the latter half of your day if you're a napper keeping your naps to 20 minutes or less um you know watching your alcohol content um finishing your meals a bit earlier keeping screens away from the bedroom and, and lights those those practices help improve your sleep hygiene which is it's important before covid and it's more important maybe with covid yeah and the other thing for ems managers that are listening is to to have a system in place where you can send your employees for um, sleep apnea testing because about a third of the population has sleep apnea. I had it and I didn't know you probably have it too. If you, if you have extra weight, if you're obese, which I am, um, you probably have sleep apnea. And uh, at GEMS, uh, you know, we'd sit around a meeting and uh, uh, Jeff Barron would be running the meeting and I'd give my report and three people away from me, and I'd be asleep, I'd be nodding off. And he called me in one day and he said, you, do you have a problem? Are, are you upset about something? I said, why? He said, you're not paying attention in that meeting. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you were nodding off. And then our mutual friend, Debbie Murray, said to me one day, you have sleep apnea. And she and another uh, coworker um, scheduled a, an appointment for me because his wife worked at a CPAP. Wow. And I went and uh, 15 minutes into it, they said, here, put this mask on. We're not even gonna finish the test. You've stopped breathing 17 times already. And I published this in the magazine. I remember. And, and the reality is uh, the next morning I felt great. And I went to work and I said, oh my God, that's the best night's sleep that I had. And then by the time it was the end of the day, I was driving uh, Kevin Flanagan, who you know, I was driving her home from work and she yelled at me and said, you're falling asleep at the wheel. Because now I had been away from my sleep for so long that I was going back into that lull. And when I went back to the doctor, he said to me, you would have never made a trip from San Diego to Las Vegas without crashing and killing yourself. And, and that really woke me up. And there's been a couple times when I've traveled and I've been ignorant and I didn't take my CPAP machine on the plane with me as overhead baggage and ended up a night or two at a hotel, uh, particularly when I was in Australia, without my CPAP machine. And 
you know what, you wake up in the morning, for anybody who's listening out there, if you're waking up in the morning with headaches, that's because you, you were anoxic during the night. You had some apnea that, that you didn't even know about. And uh, that's really important. So, you know, sleep apnea is a whole other thing to think about. Now, that, that opens up the other game now where people are worried about the firemen sleeping in the bunk room with, with a CPAP machine that's aerosolizing everything. And, you know, right? buy, buy some air conditioning filter and put it over the top. I don't care. You know, the bottom line is you need your CPAP machine or, or sleep somewhere where you, where you can use your CPAP machine and not worry about it. Yeah. So yeah, these these are really these are really tough times. Um, do you think that we're going to have a hard time um, recruiting? You know, we already are in the police in the police sector. Police don't they, they can't recruit. You know, it's now. it's a, it's an interesting interesting question. Um, and and I think there's there's potentially something that way. I mean, the other. The other issue is with so many people unemployed in the country, um, there's, there's a much bigger pool of people who need work. And uh, so, you know, I, you, can, you can make up a story that is, you know, people aren't going to want to come into the healthcare world uh, because it's scary. <clears throat> or you can say there's so many people unemployed that people are going to go, hey, I can go, go to EMT school or paramedic school in a shorter period of time and, and there's jobs available. Maybe maybe the pool will be bigger. Um, but one of the challenges is though that uh, a lot of the schools out there are having a harder time with clinical placements um, because a lot of organizations, when COVID hit, they they shut down students and and volunteers, right? Right. Um, a lot of hospitals have done the same thing, and and it's 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 a short term solution that I think is going to have long term consequences. Um, because we need need the system of new EMTs, nurses, paramedics, PAs, physicians, that the machine to produce those folks has got to got to stay alive um, in order to, to help us kind of get through all this stuff. And, and I think really, I mean, out of every bad comes some good. Um, we used to meet once a year with the Eagles, and that would really be where I'd recharge my battery. And now. Um, you know, they had to cancel their conference in Florida, but we meet every Tuesday. And so, you know, I, I've had 40 meetings with Eagles, you know, and, and that's a plus. So I think conferences and other things are never going to go back the way they were. Uh, most of my yep. doctor visits have been uh, virtual doctor visits, and I'm just happy as a clam. I got my own BP cuff. I've got my own pulse ox. Right. I don't really need to go as long as the doc can talk to me. I don't have to drive and park, et cetera, and, and he or she can talk to me as quickly as they can. So those things are going to change. EMS call volume is going to change. Um, I, I don't think, you know, if, if you're in EMS right now and you're not willing to adapt, you're going to be in trouble because uh, interfacility transfers, I'm not sure they're ever going to be the same again. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Um, it's oh. you know it, all of medicine. All of medicine is going through enough people, and we are we are in a position to help. And I think the organizations who figure that out quickly and plug in as partners to healthcare. Um, you know, it's like the you know the the telemedicine docs. You know, sometimes it's like there's just there's just one thing I need to be able to see on a patient that I can't see over a video. You know, to have us go, you know, be, be part of the mobile team that can grab that little little piece of information to complete their diagnostic picture. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot that we can do as people are, you know, hospitaling at home and, and collaborating and partnering around that kind of stuff. There's, there's a lot we have to offer. Um, if, if we wake up to it and can start the conversations, <coughs> for the rest of healthcare to wake up to us and what we have to offer. I, I, I think the, uh, the vision of EMS Agenda 2050, that done right, uh, COVID is, a, is an accelerator so that we, we're, we're not talking about stuff in, in 30 years, we're talking about it in the next three years. Oh, I mean, I know, I know people that were ET3 or on the verge of ET3 that were pushed right into it and, and they're never going back. And I think that the, um, the federal government's going to be in a position, even on the reimbursement side, that they're just 
that, that they're going to realize that they have to reimburse us. You know, the, the effort now to try and get us to be able to treat and release, that may be one of the best things that comes out of this whole, uh, this whole disaster. But, um, that, you know, there's another area, and our mutual friend Tom Dick always talked about, don't forget the elderly. I mean, um, yep. we always had this tenuous relationship with nursing homes where they called, we went in, they told us nothing. They didn't tell us the patient had a UTI. We didn't know that it was possible sepsis. Um, we didn't care or the crew didn't care because it was just another nursing home call. And uh, guess what? I have friends who've lost their moms and dads uh, because of COVID. And yeah. what were they thinking in New York and other places? I mean, you can't have two people in the same room and you can't have 15 people in the same social room um, with, with COVID being there. And you can't release somebody from a hospital that's COVID back to a nursing home. I mean, if anything out of this whole thing, if I was an operations person that I'd like to do, it'd be to go and really make Kumbaya with my nursing homes. To, and, and there's many that are doing that, that are going in and doing testing and doing these other things because Absolutely. Um, there, there's unnecessary deaths. If you look at the statistics of the 80 years old, 80 year olds that are dying, um, that's, that's a failure of the U.S. system and the whole nation system, I think it is, or the whole international system, that, that the elderly are, are even more frail than we thought they were. I couldn't agree with you more. So give me, give me, give me five things that uh, everybody who's watching here needs to do uh, when they are going on shift, when they're on shift, or when they get off shift. What, how, how can they release steam? So I think that, 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 that it's helpful to, to learn a few techniques and then find one that you overlearn. Um, because if it's not automatic, it's not going to work for you. So AJ, who, who, taught, who taught you to drive? Uh, my dad. Your dad. So, so when you think about that, that's a memory you pull up from the past, right? Mm-hmm. And that neurologically, that lives in your hippocampus. It's called an explicit memory in neuroscience. Um, but have you driven a motor vehicle this year? Mm -hmm. You have, and so have most of our listeners. And it's memory that allows you to operate your car, to use the steering wheel without running right. into anything and use right. the brake and the, the accelerator. And I, I know turn signals are optional in California, but other places that <laughs> you turn signals. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that it's memory that allows you to do that, but you don't experience that as, as you don't get in your car and go now, okay, how does the steering wheel work again? I mean, you just get in and drive, right? Um, but, and that's called implicit memory. And that lives in the prefrontal lobes of your neocortex and part of your anterior cingulate cortex. And implicit memory is where you need your stress management skills to be. Because if you... If you have to remember them in the middle of the crap, that part of your brain isn't available to you. It's got to be something that happens automatically. So we talked about toe wiggling. Um, there's the tactical breathing um, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Grossman talked about in his book on combat, um, which is, you know, you take a, a deep breath into a count of four, hold it for a count of four, blow it out for a count of four, and then hold it out for a count of four and then repeat, also called box breathing by some folks. Um, <clears throat> you know, toe wiggling, box breathing, those are, those are things you can do anywhere, anytime. Um, you know, we talked about how the peripheral nervous system kind of uh, makes, it, makes your hands and, and legs a little less sensitive. Um, also, there's the peripheral vasoconstriction, you know, you know how uh, um, calming it is to get into a hot bath or a hot tub? Mm -hmm. The reason it's so calming is the heat causes peripheral vasodilatation, which is the opposite of the stress response, and that activates the parasympathetic nerve, releases oxy oxytocin and, and, and whatnot in your brain, um, and causes you to feel relaxed. And, you know, when you're in, in somebody's living room who's mouthing off to you because they don't want to have an IV started or whatever, um, you, it, it's probably not appropriate to say, I want to go take a bath. <laughs> um, but you, one of the things you can do is you can rub your hands together and warm your hands up. 
and just rubbing your hands together and warming your hands up, that increases the temperature. It activates uh, the parasympathetic relaxation response a little bit in your body. Yeah, I know. Um, another, uh, another, I'll give you, go ahead. No, I was just going to say box breathing. There was a, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot with the military and they teach a lot about box breathing for stress. And uh, yep. I just had the knee replacement and the nurse said to me, don't forget to practice your breathing. And I said, uh, yeah, are you talking about box breathing? She said, well, whatever you want to call it, it's, uh, it's cyclical breathing where you're distracting yourself and you're taking in a really good volume of air. And she said, if you do that, she said, I work with a lot of people like you, your pain will be diminished. And I thought, you know, I believe in it to begin with. And gee, she's reminding me and I did it and boy, did it work for me. Uh, got it, hang on one quick second. Uh, I've, I've a meeting I'm late to here. That's okay. Uh, We're gonna close soon anyway. Our here we audience, go. Sorry about that. Our, our audience will certainly understand. I, yeah. I greatly appreciate you being with us, Mike. Um, tell us again the name of your book and where it's available, and uh, we'll so have a the, the, on it. There, there's the there's the book. It's Superstar Charger Stress Management in the age of COVID-19. Um, it is available on Amazon or uh, Barnes & Noble or on our, on our website, which is combatcovidstress.com. And, and that wasn't the purpose of this whole webcast uh, and, and, and discussion, but I will tell you that um, for me, someone with your background to be able to write that book means that it's worth reading so thanks again and thank uh, you very much sir thanks for your 150 years of experience crammed into a few decades and uh we'll, we'll chat again soon thank you very very much for, for having me aj okay we'll talk soon. yeah bye now